things off before we get into the main uh, presentation. But I'll give it another minute, I say, for, for people to come in uh, late. Just see, if you can see this. Are you seeing that in presented mode or are you seeing that in the, it isn't- The main screen. We can Thank see you. the main screen. Excellent. It's in the presenting mode, yeah. Oh, good. Fantastic. Um, okay, well, let's, let's slowly get going. And then if people are um, a little bit late, in and they're a little bit late. I'm sure people will pick up uh, what's going on very, very quickly. Um, as we've got a few presentations um, to go through today, and I want to allow a bit of time for that discussion at the end. Um, so thanks, everyone. It's been a while since we had our last um, our validation hub uh, meeting. I changed the name for it because realistically, it's not it's not been quarterly. Uh, it's probably been about six months since we last had um, last had a meeting uh, or, or more. Um, but that doesn't mean that we haven't been active as a hub. And if you're not signed up to the mailing list, I'd encourage you to sign up to that because we do share when we put our new blog posts and so on. And, um, and if you want to um, sign up for that and or we'll keep checking the website as well, you'll see some of the latest activities that we've, uh, we've been working on as a hub. Um, what we're going to do is because we've got this very focused session today and there'll be another one on May 24th that we're going to follow up with. So part two on the same theme will, will, will occur then. I'll send an invite out afterwards that hasn't gone out yet. And um, so if you're on the distribution list, if you're signed up to that, which you can do through the website on the Contact Us page. Um, if you're signed up to that, then you'll get an invite um, uh, later today uh, from me um, to, um, to join that next um, to join that next meeting um, and these two meetings really are with um, kind of our theme for the year so um, those of you who've been members for a long time will have seen we've put up roadmaps in the past and talked about what we're trying to do there's an initial focus on a white paper and what our kind of thinking our methodology was that was followed by a focus on tools and we're still building some tools and um, uh, you'll get some updates via the distribution list um, uh, following this meeting separately from the main theme today. Um, but the main theme today is around how people, and the main theme for the year for the group is how people are using um, the framework. So what are people um, using that's working well? What are, where are people adapting our framework? And, and so really it's about, um, it's about communication again, but it's about making, uh, making sure we understand um, how people are using, uh, using what we put out and where we might need to provide some more information potentially through future white papers and, uh, and or tools. Um, so that is essentially um, the majority of my intro. We've got four talks today, Roche, Novartis, Merck and GSK, and we'll get the um, uh, each presenter to quickly introduce themselves and their, their case studies. So they're going to walk through case studies of their, of their company about what they're trying to do um, with some sort of highlights of things that have um, uh, gone well with implementing the framework and areas where they've adapted or changed or feel that there should be improvement. Um, at the end, we'll bring it together for a sort of full discussion Q&A. So, um, some of the presenters may, may give a little bit of time for Q&A during their presentation, but we'll have a big Q&A session uh, at the end, which I'll try and, uh, try and manage for everyone. So before, just before we get into the main thing, so the first one will be um, Colleen Zevalos from, from Roche. So I'll hand over to Colleen uh, in a second to, uh, to present. But just um, whilst I have your, uh, hopefully have some of your attention, um, just to note that this Thursday, so April 28th, um, this Thursday, there, um, our consortium are running a session um, called Reporting uh, Table Creation in, in R. And you can see the advert for it uh, there on the left. You can sign up from the R consortium um, homepage. There's a webinars link that you can quite easily get to from the, the top menu there. Um, if, you, if you're not aware, that's not signed up. Um, it's not an R validation hub activity, but it, um, we are part of the R, um, R consortium. and um, if you're here, you're probably in some way involved in um, or interested in our adoption um, within your organizations. Uh, and the theme for those uh, webinars is very much around our adoption. So the next one is on um, tables. And if um, you may be aware that there is an RTRS uh, a tables focused working group through the R consortium as well that runs in parallel to this one. So we consider those one of our partners. So if you want to um, hear about that, uh, Gabe. Um, is going to be um, uh, leading a presentation talking about 
um, something called R tables, um, which many of you will probably be aware of as an open source um, package from uh, from Roche, not just R tables, but our whole e ecosystem ar around that. Um, and the other thing I've already mentioned today is the R validation hub, all hands part two. So uh, 24th of May, you'll get that invite soon. You shouldn't, you won't have it yet. So you get that before the end of the day. And it'll be, um, we, we hope for more companies presenting their case studies. Okay, well, with that, I will stop sharing and uh, hopefully uh, Colleen is online and ready to, ready to, she's, Colleen is not. I'm, I'm jumping in, Andy. Uh, this is Doug. We have um, Shaman representing Roche today, who's um, on the call. Fantastic. Um, I love it when problems solve themselves very quickly. So uh, that's fantastic. So um, Shaman, I'll let, let you take over sharing. Um, I try to do it. I first have to allow my Zoom to, um, to be taken. Uh, I will have to restart the application due to like new system. New, new, my, I, my new Mac does not allow me to share. I have to restart Zoom. So we'll be back in 30 seconds. You know, Keith, uh, if it's longer than 30 seconds, I'll switch the, uh, I'll switch the order. So um, uh, second uh, on the list is uh, Matt Fiddler from Novartis. So if, uh, Matt, if you could be on standby just in case. Um, otherwise, I'll try and give it uh, 20 or 30 seconds more of a um, of fill <laughs> until, until he's back. Um, are there any, um, any questions that anyone has uh, immediately kicking off before we start? I'm not expecting it, but if someone wants to break from my voice, you're welcome to say something. Uh, sorry for that one, but fortunately, ah, it, was the, it was that another problem that solves instantly. So uh on on the nicer part uh okay so are you able to see my slides right now yep. yes and the presentation yes. Is all good cool thank cool you. thank you so uh as as, as we already know uh, my name is Shimon Maksenuk and today i will pro pro present automate our package validation by Roche Pharma validation team uh led by the Colin Zebaios and Doug Kachelhoff uh, and the members of the team are also Lorenzo Braschi and myself. Uh, so first I would like to unite some design priorities we put in front of us while pre pre preparing the process. So first is leveraging best practices for our package development. Uh, we believe that those practices are some kind of guidelines that adhering to which will allow us to minimize the risk of potential flaws in the package. Then we, want, we wanted to automate the process of uh, getting those checks done, but at the very same time, avoid special cases for particular class of packages. So if we ever decide to allow some exceptions, we, allow, we want to allow those except, exceptions for every possible package, not just for particular subclass. Uh, then moving forward, we want to minimize the package's scope. So as you as you are aware, like a lot of packages in R does not necessarily provide a unique functionality. They are rather interfaces for other functionalities like databases, APIs, and so on and other. Uh, in that case, the, we, uh, as the team that is validating those packages are responsible only for the R language part of this package. So we are not interested in the system they talk to. This will be handled by another validation process. Then important part in our process in the human, and we want the human to be in the middle of it. So for instance, if some automated checks are failing, we want to, the human to have the last decision what to do with such package. Thanks to that, we believe that we balance also risk mitigation against automation. Uh, because for instance, if a package is failing for uh, some like false positive even problem or a minor RCMD check note, that uh, is not applicable to any regulatory uh, use case, then we want this package to be permitted. Uh, and thanks to human eye in the, uh, human in the middle of this process, we can leverage that one. Uh, going forward, we, with our validation, we target reproducible systems, uh, mostly containers. It's because containers can be shipped for one device to another, uh, saving all of the system uh, settings 
And this ensures that a validated package that was, that, uh, was validated in a container will work the same way regardless of the system it's running on because of that container. And last but not least, we want the whole process to be transparent to encourage in-house development and iterations. Here is a small graph that presents, uh, this presents our process. I will briefly go through it and then uh, explain each step in detail. So, so everything starts with a validation, with a request. Uh, so package has to be requested uh, to us and it can be either external or internal package. Externally developed package can be CRUN packages, bio packages, public GitHub, public GitHub, whatever. Uh, while internal packages are those developed within, within Roche and those are usually submitted via CICD. Then we run uh, uh, our, auto, our tool that first automatically gathers pa package metadata and just after uh, triggers automated set of checks. The later steps depend on the results of those checks. If the checks passed the, uh, and everything is fine, then we run a reverse dependency check against other uh, validated packages to make sure that the upgrade or a new package will, will not crash anything. And if that package is also uh, passing, then we, are, then we are publishing the package to a validated package repository and generating a report. If the automated check failed, then we have that human in the middle I've mentioned previously. And that human eye uh, represented by, by, two, uh, by a pair of eyes on, on this graph uh, actually assess the severity of the failure and whether it can, uh, it can potentially uh, inflict some of the regulatory work. If it's not severe, uh, we justify those, th those failures, why we can permit to happen, and proceed with the later, with the later validation as it were passing, uh, as all of the checks were passing. So uh, reverse dependence check and so on and so forth. As for the submission, the submission really has only two prerequisites. The first prerequisite is our dependencies. We require all of the dependencies to be validated first and every unmet dependency will, out, will out, uh, immediately stop the execution. And the, execu and the execution of the validation process won't, won't res resume until all of the, the hard dependencies are validated. Uh, and the second prerequisite is that the source code of the package has to be reproducible. So it has to be either a Git repository, a Git hash, or a checksum associated with a tarball. Uh, later, the submission triggers a CIDC the workflow managed for a merge, uh, through merge requests. This actually allows requesters, developer, but also a support team member uh, to, over the, to, to see and monitor every part of the, of the, uh, of the process, of every part of the validation process. So every step is recorded and can be witnessed from inside this merge request. This, this also provides a grant for a discussion. So developer or a person that requests a package can ask questions, raise concerns, basically tell whatever they, they have in mind regarding this validation inside of the merge request associated with the validation. So everything is one place and it's kind of public, uh, public actually, uh, obviously to the internal extent. And as a result of that one, obviously, submissions are overseen by the supportive member and we are ready at the, every step to uh, help uh, with the submission. And the next step is actually the package metadata collection. So, so as I said, we have that automated tool that collects data about the package uh, that we will we'll later use to populate the report. And start, we start with, with a basic metadata. So, so name, version, alpha, description, documentation, basically everything that can be used to present this package in a later report. Then we execute RCMD check and record those results. We execute tests and uh, calculate coverage. Then we map unit tests to the documentation objects, uh, building a traceability matrix. Yes. And last but not least, we record a system information uh, about, about basically about the system where all the, those checks happened. And uh, answering the question how they are collected, so they are first collect, uh, all of the, the checks are executed in a control, controlled reproducible analytic environment. So basically in, in like simpler words, an environment that already has an R validated in it. In it. That's simple as that. And, the, and the, secondly, we strictly manage dependencies. So we allow only dependencies that were later uh, validated prior and they can be installed only from a validated R package repository. 
And here's some table that summarize those metadata we collect. Source control and documentation are thing that's clear. If it comes to our CMD check, uh, we, this is our hard requirement that it has to pass without any errors. Ideally, it will pass also without warning and notes, but this can be later addressed. As for tests, they all have to pass. The cloud coverage has to be above 80%. And uh, as for traceability, every exported functionality has to be evaluated at least by one unit test. But it can happen- Recording only... in progress. Okay, uh, okay, <laughs> never mind. Uh, so, but obviously it can happen that uh, package may have some gaps that has to be addressed. Uh, and it can be, those can be really minor. So like coverage is for instance, 75 instead of 80% or some small note about enhanced package not available for checking. Uh, in such case, uh, we can address those gaps. As I said, using that human in the middle, I will repeat it over and over again, but I simply think it's very important for, for our process. And uh, those addressing gaps can go into paths. It can be either CRAN comments, uh, margin file, so shout out to CRAN, or remediation procedure. Unfortunately, I don't have much time today, so I cannot ex uh, explain those processes in detail, but feel free to uh, visit our pharma uh, case studies GitHub there will be this, this exact presentation, but with slides added about both of those sections. And answering the last basic question, so what comes after validation? So the validated packages are uploaded to a validated R package repository. Uh, and I we, we think that it's also, although it seems like it's end of it, but we think that's an important part of our process because it actually allows us to leverage CRAN style rolling package release so we can use snapshot, we can use archive, we can use simple remote install version to, insta to sometimes roll back if the uh, upgrade was, is not sufficient for us. Uh, we can also, the, it also helps users because users, uh, we embed the appropriate option repos to, to the image. So then users using it does not, don't even have to know whether they are using a validated package or not. They simply will always get a validated package. They will, they will, they can focus on the purely on work instead of uh, thinking whether I got a validated package or not. Oh my God, what to do? They don't have to do it. They just get a validated package using install.packages and everything works. And the second step after validation is report generation. So report, uh, our report is a mix of static and dynamic document. So static parts are basically part of explain the process, explain some vocabulary used during the check process and so on and so forth. Why dynamic part is those are simply made data collected uh, during the check, embed, embedded to the report and rendered together. And all of this is uploaded to the document management service. And, and to summarize all of this, uh, we believe that we created an automate, uh, automated strict set of, set of rules, but a set of rules that only highlights uh, gaps to the support team members. And uh, important note is that validation applies only to a specific version of the package run on the specific system. So if we like upgrade the R version or uh, change the architecture, the validation does not hold. Holds. And uh, to, to say it at the, at the end, we believe that the process we've developed assures high quality of the packages for regulatory analysis, reinforces internal developers' familiarity with, familiarity with best R programming practices, because of those possibly possible reiterations of a package after addressing gaps and reduces risk by making our analysts and developers more capable contributors. And, and I think that will be it. And I really appreciate your time and thank you for that. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I already have at least five questions <laughs> myself. But we're going to save questions for the end because we're on the sort of 10 minute mark. So we'll go to the next question, uh, the next presentation, then we'll come back and um, some of those questions will probably be generic to many of the presentations. So um, thank you for that. Next up, we've got Matt um, Fiddler from Novartis, I believe. Um, are you here, Matt? And is it you <laughs> is presenting for us? Uh, um, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, Matt. Great. Let me see if I can share my screen. I don't know if I need special permissions or not. <clears throat> you should can be able to. Yep, we can see that. Awesome. Okay. Uh, I'm not a Zoom user, so I'm trying to move things around here. 
Okay, my name is Matt Fiddler, and I am presenting on behalf of the R Governance Group, and Dave is also here with me. What we're talking about is our package risk assessment and validation that we're currently using at Novartis. It's a little bit different than some of the other approaches I've seen here, so I think it bears some discussion. So the basic approach here is a risk-based setup with pre-installed packages that allow ad hoc installed packages as well. So there are four different types of risks that we have. We have high risk packages, medium risk packages, low risk packages, and then uh, intolerable risk profile packages. And we'll talk about what goes on in each of those cases. And for the user, we have two different use cases. We have one where everything's pre-installed and that's always available to the users as they start up their R session. And then we have an ad hoc installation to address a specific analysis need as long as it meets certain requirements for regulatory work. So as we talked about here, we have three different types of risks. First is the low risk types of packages. In the low risk, we wanna make sure that it's from a height trusted source, for example, base R, recommended software from the base R distribution, like NLME, for instance, or the tidyverse dependencies. If it's something that's from a reputable source, we believe it's also a low risk that it includes something like R Studio or Microsoft. Um, the other thing we assess for reputable source is if there's a large amount of community usage, which includes a very high download rate, or a large number of reverse dependencies. And then also some packages just by their nature are low risk. For example, a display package where one of the display packages in R is praise, it's used for test that. But its only purpose is to praise a user for doing a great job. There's not really any risk to analysis by telling them they did a good job. Or for instance, data packages, where they only have data within that package. There's no risk to analysis for those particular types of packages. So there are low risk package. So if all those are false, we go to the next tier of risk. This would include coverages that are queried from the package. Um, our current threshold is 60%. If you're above 60% coverage, we assume that you're a medium risk package. The other risk assessment that we look at here is, is this package in a peer reviewed journal with uh, credible citations. If that's the case, we also considered a medium risk package. High risk packages must maintain some certain criteria. They have to have documentation, you have to have releases, you have to have frequencies of updates, but that's not sufficient to be in our system. We also have to have a user do a installation qualification, not just installation qualification, but additional PQ tests. So these additional tests and what's used in testing in the R environment at Novaris are categorized based on use case. So for the use case one, the pre-install packages, all packages undergo formal IQ and OQ testing by IT. Low risk and medium risk packages do not require a business unit testing or no PQ testing. We still believe there's adequate evidence consider them sufficiently trustworthy to use without the dedicated PQ. All high risk packages require business testing to, or the PQ testing to verify the most important functions that are used in analyses. The documentation for all this process is done with standard lifecycle management tool and with QA approval. For the ad hoc usage, we make sure that the user installs the package and runs all the package tests, vignettes, and examples. We make sure the user does a risk assessment. All that information is stored in whatever project location they have their data in and their analysis in. For high-risk packages, business users are asked to store additional evidence. They have to prove the credibility of the package, review the evidence, and the evidence has to be reviewed with the project team. And the project team ultimately has the accountability to sign off on any high-risk package used in an actual analysis. 
We also have a tool to help with this ad hoc installation and risk assessment. We, this tool is an R package that ensures the proper ad hoc package installation. By default, it uses whatever snapshot date we have in our, in our system. Currently, we're using MRAN, although we could use RStudio in the future. Um, but once it has an MRAN date, we have the user install whatever package version that existed at that MRAN date to ensure match, maximum compatibility. We also install all the suggested dependencies and the tests to be able to run the examples, the test, and the vignettes. All those are run during the time of the ad hoc install, and all that information is stored into a zip file. That zip file is saved for evidence of that the successful installation was performed, and you can look at it and see the review, the data to make sure that it makes sense. It also stores the package version information if you're using a different version or a GitHub or a GitLab or a Bitbucket type of source to make sure that whatever you use is reproducible. It also conducts a, the risk assessment that we just talked about using metadata from the R package ecosystem and uses that to infer what the risk is based on our current practices. And that is stored in a Word document with embedded R information in it. And with that, that's everything I have for this brief overview of what we do at Novartis. If there's any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you. Um, Timing-wise, I'm going to move on with questions, but I think there's already been one question in the chat. I think that's another thing. If people want to put the questions in the chat, at least then we've got there. I, I think we're going to run out of time, to be honest, to get through like a ton of questions at the end, because there will be lots. So put the questions there, at least we've got them documented. And th this can, um, as, as we mentioned, a couple of the presenters have mentioned already, we are looking to capture this um, in a, as well as the meeting here today, we're looking to capture this on the site in GitHub, so we will have um, questions that we can address through that in kind of formal written case case studies uh, as well. So all the questions you've got will be captured and answered in some capacity, whether we send out answers after the meeting or whether we address them in the meeting, um, or if we do them within the papers that will that will follow. So please do document the questions, put them out, um, just in case you don't get a chance to ask them at the end. Um, with that, I'll move us on to um, our third presentation which is pre-fan if you are hey, Andy, can you hear me yes we can okay and can you see my screen yes we're not seeing the presenters you were seeing the uh, now we are yeah that's okay all, good. all right uh thank you for the opportunity to present at the meeting and um i'm pritam i uh represent uh bots uh from mark uh we are being uh trying to implement the r package qualification uh, based on the different frameworks that we've been exploring and so this is just a simple case study that we are going to be demonstrating using ggle package uh, my co-authors are Paul Bernicke, uh, Jane Leo, and uh, Elon Zhang. So starting off uh, with respect to the package implement uh, qualification implementation, we just looked at uh, first uh, the different guidance that's available uh, from either from both uh, regulatory authorities as well as uh, cross industry initiatives. So we focused on uh, both the FDA guidance as well as the ICH guidelines for the different uh, validation requirements and also the different frameworks that are available from the cross industry initiatives, uh, both our validation hub and transfer rate uh, MS initiative. So we have uh, taken elements from both our validation hub and transfer rate framework to implement a qualification framework uh, that minimizes both risk and increases the confidence in the package being qualified. So with that, uh, just uh, a quick overview of what uh, the qualification framework at Merck is being implemented as a, a risk-based package uh, qualification, which includes a risk-based strategy, uh, which uh, looks at the different types of uh, analysis and reporting deliverables that are being used, that are being delivered using the package. And uh, the goal is to create the documentation that contains uh, qualification details related to that package based on some uh, pre-specified criteria. So there's some uh, examples that are uh, 
available that um, that can be used to look at the different risk levels is um, the deliverable. So if that package is being used for some sort of an external deliverable, such as an ECDD uh, required a deliverable, including CSR requests and uh, submission packages, then that package has to be qualified under the low risk. If it's uh, non-ECTD or um, other requests such as uh, data monitoring committee requests or manuscripts and publication requests, it could be either in moderate or low risk. And if it's purely for data exploration or exploratory analysis, then it could be in the open risk or any of the other categories. Based on this, uh, we have also uh, defined the different uh, criteria that are required for the package qualification. So we have uh, specified about five different criteria that are required for the different levels of uh, classification. So a low risk package needs to meet at least uh, the first four criteria listed here, C1 to C C4. And one criteria is sufficient to qualify it within a low risk category. A moderate risk uh, can be qualified using any of those um, C1 to C5 criteria. And uh, open risk is any package that is available on CRAN or bioconductor and uh, is not qualified under either the low risk or moderate risk. And uh, we have guidance in space within the organization that open risk cannot, uh, packages cannot be directly used for regulatory purposes. So that is something that is already in place and uh, it's a part of the standard operating procedure. Now, within this uh, context, we also have uh, an implementation of the global R library within MARC, uh, which is a, a library that contains a set of directories with all the R packages and their dependencies installed. So this, uh, the goal of this R library is to um, establish the shared baseline approach that R Studio um, uh, uh, RStudio approaches within the R package management and uh, helps with uh, providing all of the users a uniform and shared baseline environment we can start with. And uh, they don't, don't have to worry about uh, different dependencies or any of the other issues that pop up with package management. Uh, this global library is updated approximately three every three months or as per business needs uh, required. And uh, in order to uh, update this and also maintain the R library. We are using the R uh, Studio Package Manager, the RSPM for the package repository server, and also to install the packages in the global library. Within the global library, we have the three uh, risk categories, as I specified before, the low, moderate, and open, and it is a nested structure. Um, so with all the low risk packages are part of the moderate risk category, and all of the moderate risk are all part of the open risk. Uh, the open risk category packages are anything that a user installs or downloads within uh, internally within Merck from either uh, from the RSPM as the RSPM is already synced with the CRAN or by a conductor. So they have access to most of the packages um, that are available online. So when we come to the package qualification workflow that we are implementing, um, this is a quick overview about how the uh, qualification workflow works out is we use a snapshot date within the RSPM to pick a particular date where all the packages are frozen and uh, then use uh, then also have a, a document about uh, which packages are need to be updated within the different risk categories. This, this uh, package list only contains um, moderate and low risk packages that need to be qualified because the open risk are already uh, part of the library and they don't need to be qualified separately. Then uh, we create a request form that can be uh, used to inform IT about the installation of the different uh, packages risk, risk categories. Yeah. Uh, before we send it off to IT, we do a dry run installation of these packages to check if there's any issues with respect to uh, installation or any uh, dependency issues. Once that is complete, we send the request to IT and they start the uh, installation process. And once that is complete, we, and the, in the in the in the, uh, simultaneously, we also generate the qualification documents that are required to uh, qualify that uh, that package into a low or a moderate risk uh, category. Uh, within with that in mind, uh, the GGRE package was uh, a case study that we uh, that we are we'd like to present. Uh, the GGRE is a, a R package that extends uh, ggplot2 functionality and uh, is uh, requested uh, by some of our internal teams for a moderate risk category uh, for publication purposes. 
And so at the present, at the time of qualification, this package was in the open risk. And so the process uh, is highlighted here. It started with us reviewing the package doc documentation to determine which qualifying criteria the package could be qualified under. And then we performed a dry run installation for the global R library update. Um, with this in mind, I'd also like to point that we have an internally developed R package that um, uh, does automate most of this process and it's not a manual process. We just uh, use the functionals from that package to automate most of these uh, steps. Um, so once the dry run is complete, we also do a check of installation log for any errors or warnings regarding this package installation. And then also do a, a package a code coverage and associated uh, STLC documentation check. So you can see here two, uh, two screenshots about uh, the different STLC documentation. The one on the left is from the GitHub of the ggplot2. Uh, GG and that is uh, replicated within the RSPM because it's uh, synchronized with the, uh, the CRAN and the bioconductor um, sources. Once this, uh, this uh, package coverage and uh, uh, associated SDLC documentation is complete, we also cross-check against an internet, uh, internal uh, database, which contains a list of R package authors that are in the trusted category and we call a whitelist. Um, so these are authors that um, have um, had a history of uh, uh, package publications or who uh, have had um, Package, uh, package downloads more than uh, 1,000 uh, 1, within the next uh, last two years. So we have a set criteria which includes these uh, trusted authors. Once this com uh, checks are complete, uh, the qualification document is uh, generated. Um, that qualification document I would like to point out, if I can open it really quick, is a HTML, HTML file that can be used to um, And this is the qualification document that is actually generated for the different uh, uh, for the different qualifications, and it includes a complete documentation of what level of uh, what risk levels, including the qualification date and the criteria. So, and it has information about the packages, including the SDLC, as well as the different dependencies for the different uh, packages that are uh, that are dependent on this, and as well as the qualification details in detail about uh, how this package was qualified into moderate risk. Go back here. So in conclusion, we have uh, implemented a risk-based uh, qualification process at uh, Mark to classify the different packages based on the <clears throat> deliverables that are generated using that package. And the, uh, we demonstrated this uh, risk, uh, the package framework, a uh, qualification framework using the GGLE package, uh, which was qualified under the moderate risk. Um, there is still work in progress in the, in the internally developed R package for automate more of the processes, including um, uh, checking for the different installation and, uh, errors as well as dependency checks. And um, there is also ongoing work into defining the pre-specified criteria uh, to uh, qualify an organization or group of vendors as trusted source. This was uh, brought up during a recent uh, internal QA team um, uh, discussion where there was more feedback uh, given about how we could be using a specified criteria to qualify uh, organization as a trusted source or trusted vendor. So we're still working on that particular part of the uh, process. So with that, any questions or feedback, here's my email and that's pretty much my presentation. Thanks, Pritam. We're, we're a little bit um, behind on time, so I'm going to quickly get on to Ellis and, and Becca. Um, we'll probably have about 10 to 15 minutes, maybe, depending on how quick you guys are um, for questions at the end. Remember, all of this is feeding into documents afterwards. Uh, so I'm just going to keep filling, guys, until you've got your screen, uh, your slides up on screen. Um, but um, everything will be um, shared through those talks uh, afterwards. If you don't get a chance to ask a question today, um, uh, you'll get a chance to that forum. And uh, in May 24th, when we repeat this exercise, we'll reduce down the number of presentations as so we've got on a good half hour so for the discussion then. All right, with that, I'll hand over to you, Ellis or Becca, whoever is going first. Well, thanks, Andy. Um, Ellis, do you wanna lead us off? Sure thing. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So today we'll be talking about our package assessment and the general ideas behind the way that we're approaching uh, assessing various R packages. Uh, my name is Ellis Hughes. I'm a data science lead in the innovation team at GSK. 
Becca, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Yep. I'm I'm Becca Kraus. I, I work with Ellis. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Tilo Blank, who is who's also on the call and he's he's working with us on this and advising us as well. So yeah, okay, let's go on to the next slide. So the way that we're approaching a package assessment is that we're really trying to do risk and mitig risk mitigation, and it really is along a spectrum. So we're trying to balance case specific uh, time and effort in, involved with package assessment with how quickly can we get this done and uh, how much information can we gather quickly. Um, so there's two two sides of this, um, and it really depends on the risk uh, the organization is willing to take on and the interp interpretation of the documentation that exists that's been presented in uh, prior presentations like the ICH E9, which is uh, you need proof and documentation that the software is appropriately tested. Um, and so we're kind of taking into account advice from the R Validation Hub and just generally observing how the pharma community is approaching this. So there's one end of the spectrum, which is complete reliance on automated assessments which is uh, really only trying to use measurables, really produced a lot by like risk metric or, um, or things like that, like test coverage and whatnot. Um, you execute the included tests. Uh, you look at general package development criteria. So does it pack, pass the R command check uh, that's included with CRAN? Is it on CRAN? If it is, there's usually a lot of trust already with the package itself, uh, but really we're trying to gain empirical evidence to prove why we should trust a package. And the value in this is that it's really scalable, it grows really quickly. You can assess a lot of packages uh, with minimal effort, um, but it does have the possibility of you just start generating data without looking at what does, what does this mean? What is the implication of this assessment? Um, and it, there's not as much nuance in it. Um, and then if there is any situations where if you've completely automated everything, and something crashes, adding a human back into the loop uh, can really gum things up and really make this slow. Um, and so your fallback methods for complete reliance on automated processes uh, needs to be really robust. The other side of the spectrum is complete reliance on uh, expert opinion. So this is where you have an expert go in, look at the package, look at the functions, look at how you're planning on using the package. Um, what is the package doing? Is it statistical in nature or is it uh, data manipulation? Is it used for utilities? Uh, and, and that's really focusing on what is the package doing and relying on your experts to do this. Um, and they can look at uh, additional things like what is the development plan? What is, plan, what is the uh, software development lifecycle? How robust is the code? How robust are the tests? Uh, the issue with this is that um, you're really tied by how much time your expert has to be reviewing these packages. And there's a limited number of experts, just there, there's a limited number of people in the world that have this number, this amount of expertise. Um, and then if you don't really want them spending all their time just looking at packages because there's a reason you hired them, you want them to be spending their expertise, not on does this package work, but actually using these packages. Um, and so our goal is to hit a middle ground, if you want to click space. And this is to leverage both of these ideas, where we can use our automated assessments to try to target our experts so that they're not wasting their time on things that's not valuable, where they're not adding value to, to the review. So they don't need to worry at, look, at looking at, like, what is the test coverage? Does it meet a minimum bar? Um, those sorts of things. It's Given the way this package is behaving, let's look at that and look at the way we intend on using the package. And through the lens of the information we gather through this automated assessment, what is the final conclusion of the package? Do we trust it? Do we not? Do we want to push it forward? Um, and so, the yeah, so we're trying to combine these two and reduce wasted time. Um, so we do this by establishing a baseline level of trust. So we're using the ideas that still ex uh, that exist um, that have been compiled by uh, the R Validation Hub using risk metric, using uh, tools that already exist, uh, test coverage, you can look at CodeCov and whatnot. Um, but then you also look at other things like the documentation quality. So that's a little bit outside of the risk metric world, but it is still pretty straightforward to do um, where you start looking at how the vignettes are they helpful? Do they answer the basic questions? Can they get a user really going and using the package? 
the, the help pages themselves. Are they instructive? Do they provide good examples? What are the main functions that exist inside of the package? Um, and then you can look at the community itself. Is there a uh, paper that they wrote that was submitted and was not accepted? Do they write blog posts? Do they respond to issues on their GitHub page? Um, things like that to really help derive the initial assessment of how they look at the package. Um, and that then drives this next piece that Becca is going to talk about. Yeah, so so when we have this baseline level of trust, we're equipped with it. Um, that informs really the next step in the process. And for us, that is really focused on testing and test quality. Um, so with that baseline uh, level of how much we trust it, that dictates how big of an investment we're going to do in, in assessing tests and, and really doing a deep dive there. Um, and so that involves figuring out test quality. You know, it's a little bit different concept from test coverage and whether there's tests or not, which we, we gain in that first part of the assessment. Um, so, so figuring out test quality really does require us to look inside the code itself, inside the code base. Um, so this step involves actually looking in the files and, um, you know, we need to either obtain the tarball or the, the go to the GitHub repo, click around and see what we need. Um, at this point, we've already identified key pieces of functionality that we're concerned with. Um, so, you know, the most important functions are the ones we would focus on. And from there, we're, we're trying to navigate the, the different files, you know, the source code and the documentation and the, the tests and, and so forth. Um, a package and, and the package directory is not really meant for doing this easily. So what we've done, what we're working towards is having a nice interface for doing this more easily. Um, so we have a prototype that we've built that allows you to, whatever package you're assessing, allows you to actually peek inside and, and navigate these pieces a little easier. Um, so I just have a series of screen uh, screenshots for the app here um, for this prototype. For this example, we're looking at the read Excel package. Uh, we have a drop down here on the left of the various uh, exported functions we can toggle between. Let's say I'm interested in looking at the read underscore Excel function um, specifically. Uh, so that one's selected and I have three tabs here for, for some key pieces, uh, test code, source code, and the help page. Uh, with the source code, it's literally just the, the code file for that. So we can see you know, exactly how it's being programmed. Um, perhaps of a little bit more interest for this exercise is, is the help page and the test code. So the help page allows us to see exactly what the function is meant to do, its inputs and outputs, and really the different scenarios, different use cases that can come up. And then from there, we can actually look at tests and the, the test files and see how well um, and in, in what, what will You can see when I, when I clicked over to the test code tab, uh, there's um, a little dynamic portion of the UI that pops up. All of the uh, test that files, all of the test that scripts that call our function of interest someplace in there. Um, so you have access to, to all the places it's tested, not just uh, the test read Excel function. Um, so another, another thing that we makes this process easier is if we can direct whoever's using the, whoever's doing the assessment, if we can have a visual, a little more visual direction, visual cues to, to make this uh, quicker so they can eat more easily find the places that, that the function's being tested. So here you can see the, the code highlighting that, uh, that helps with that. Um, so I, I want to step back and say that that the risk assessment app that that Marley's spearheading is um, really a nice way to uh, take the risk metric package and uh, add this human component. Um, so we're talking with Marley about uh, adding this in potentially to the to the risk assessment app, this ability to manually uh, navigate the, the actual 
package contents um, and, and be able to perform this exercise in the same place uh, as, as the rest of the assessment that, that we mentioned earlier, as the rest of the rest of the assessment that involves more of those automated pieces. Um, so that's all we have as part of this presentation, but we're happy to take any questions uh, in the next few minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Becca. Thanks, Alison. Thank you to all of the presenters um, today. We've uh, we were perhaps a little bit ambitious with the four presentations to take because we've we've got to the point where we've only got uh, nine minutes uh, left of the call. So what we're going to do is pivot slightly with this. And so um, next time um, when we meet on the 24th, we will focus that more on the discussion side. So for now, if there are kind of clarifying questions for the presenters, it'd be good to hear those. Um, otherwise, as I say, please use the chat and document those. And hopefully we can get an export of that chat later so that we can um, uh, we can address those uh, within the discussion because um, there are no doubt plenty of questions. Uh, Julie, in fact, Julianne has just um, posted in there. Can you please send the questions to her um, her email address there? So if you can post the questions to Julianne. And thank you, uh, before I, we do run out of time, I just want to say thank you to Julianne for coordinating this and getting all the presenters um, uh, together as well um, for, for today. So thank you, Julianne, for, um, for sorting that out. and. Um, uh, Thanks again for the presenters today. So are there any um, quick uh, sort of qualifying questions that anyone has based on the, the presentations today? I'm not sure if everyone can unmute themselves. I think people can self-unmute. If not, I will ask one slight, uh, one question that verges on discussion. And that is with respect to when, when packages enter this process, um, this question for all presenters, um, who governs what packages are allowed to enter the process? So are, can any package um, be put through your processes? Or is there someone kind of, is there a, a pre-gateway before you even get into the process to decide whether a package is allowed to go through that or not? Um, Andy, this is Preetam. So within Mark, uh, we have a process. I mean, we have some of our, our governance uh, committee that actually looks at the different use cases for these packages before they're qualified. And also during the qualification, we do have a review panel of uh, comprising of one uh, programmer and as well as statistician that do the review of the different qualification documents and uh, make sure that the uh, packages are properly qualified. So we do have some gateways that actually govern these processes implementation as well mm, for Roche so internally developed packages so those packages that uh, were developed for Roche employees and are uh, the source code is available on the uh, either Roche uh, GitLab or GitHub so any like source code uh, platform so those packages uh, have, can be validated freely so so basically on demand so whenever the 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 maintainer decides the package uh, is in a place when it can be validated, the process starts. Uh, as for the crown packages and, and externally developed packages, they also can be requested by anyone at the very every moment, but those should, uh, are uh, require acceptance by the by the team, by the validation team. From my point of view, this is Matt at Novaris. Uh, we actually have our automated risk assessment forms look at uh, all the packages that are evaluated. For the ones that are high risk, that's where we do the most reviewing because we just want to make sure that these high risks are not in the entire risk category. Um, we also make sure that we review the PQs in that point. So. So in general, we're kind of sorting this out as well. Uh, we're going to have a team of individuals that are experts uh, that will be reviewing the packages just for use case. And then there's an additional team of people that will actually be doing the evaluation of the individual packages that will be giving feedback as to whether we'll be accepting those packages. So it's kind of like a twofold approach. At least that's a general thought right now. Thanks, everyone. Um, just to give a flavor for, for the sorts of things that we will continue to this, in this discussion, there's been a couple of other suggestions around taking discussion to Slack and so on. We do have a Slack group. It's not been heavily used by this group in, in, um, 
historically, but um, that's another area you can take some questions to potentially as well. So we'll, we'll try and work out the best way to, to get that conversation kind of flowing continuously uh, with the presenters. But the idea was that the, these things will be shared on, on GitHub and there will be a public record of like all the quick Q&A that will be there. So if you're not able to make the discussion, for example, on the 24th of May, um, then you will be able to access some of the, the information, the questions that have been um, asked in, in, in some other way. Um, I can at least promise that. Um, other questions that are coming in, things around like um, how have people worked with um, their quality teams um, around these process? Do, do people have like new SOPs and, and the like to, to govern those? Um, so that, that one's come in. Uh, then we don't have to answer all these now, but just to give you an idea of the sorts of things that are coming up. Um, how do you um, look at, you know, if, if people are using combinations of packages that are not um, uh, not part of your testing process, if people, people are doing things that, you know, you, you can only test so much. So if people are using things in an ad hoc way, uh, does, does that matter? Does, how, um, how do you account for that in the, in the process? Um, question that hasn't, uh, hasn't come on, but I wanted to ask was around if, a, if a, say, a study team is looking to use a package or you're looking to use a function that's in a package that isn't in the, the current set, how would you accommodate that? Would it have to go through the process or do you have a means to, um, for teams to kind of almost self-certify and go, it's okay, I know this one function is fine or, or would they have to kind of write that up, you know, write the function themselves in their own code? So how would you handle packages that are not part of your, your, base, um, your base set? Because obviously if you install a new package, for example, if you had, uh, I think it was a Roche presentation, we talked about containers. So if you add a new package to a container, you've kind of changed what's been tested, validated, qualified. Um, so, so how do you cope for that? Uh, how do you count for that? And there's a there's a bunch of other questions on there um, or, or already. Um, so with with that, with three minutes left, I'll give everyone a bit of time back in their um, in their calendars. Um, we will pick this conversation up. Um, thank you again to the presenters, and um, we'll we'll see you guys all all soon. Fantastic turnout today. So obviously a lot of interest in seeing these case studies. Uh, so we look forward to a couple more case studies and a big discussion next time. Uh, just a quick question, Andy. Will the case studies uh, that we sent out be posted on the GitHub? Julian, do you want to talk a little bit about the, the process? Yes, so we have a, a GitHub repo, and uh, you should be able to create a pull request, and we should go through and actually approve them. Um, so we put that on our to-do list as well. Sure. Okay. Um, Thank, thank you, everyone. Clearly, a lot of interest in this in this topic. Um, uh, nice to see everyone back again, um, and we'll see you all in a, a month's time. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thanks, Andy. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.